Yes, good afternoon. And uh, is this working? It's yes. First of all, uh, thanks so much for this opportunity. I'm obviously coming to your university a few weeks after the passing of your rector. So uh, let me first of all uh, really convey our uh, condolences uh, to the university and his family. His passing, you know, really looking at the last few you know, weeks uh, since it happened. And it's not just really the loss uh, to Stellenbosch University and the community, it's a loss uh, to the entire country. Mm. As a country, can ill afford to lose such wonderful human beings. But uh, we've got to really accept that this is life and this is how things uh, really happen. Secondly, thanks uh, for this privilege to, to really come and really address you. Looking at my life some 30 odd years ago, I was a young student, like some of you, uh, had an opportunity to be at the university only one and a half years of my life. At the time when I was studying, I thought I was going to become a political scientist of knowledge. I thought I was going to to study until I get my professorship uh, to become a political scientist. But unfortunately, my life has always really been a roller coaster. I really had a fantastic life. Starting, obviously, beginning of it quite difficult, but uh, just over 30 years, just really took a very positive uh, turn. Um, positive in the sense that. Um, it unleashed something that I probably believe I was born with. Something that uh, this country always finds it difficult to, to accept, acknowledge and embrace. Um, it actually unleashed the capitalist in me. Something uh, which I find really quite strange that South Africans, and particularly uh, South Africans, uh, are always shy away from admitting that all, as, all of us as human beings are capitalists. Because as soon as you refuse to accept that you're capitalist, you have a confused mind. You have a confused uh, approach to, to the reality of your situation. Because all of us are strongly believed that we were born to be individuals, we were born to really be responsible for our own future, to be responsible for our own destiny. As soon as, obviously, you start to argue with that that's when you're not going to be able to really find uh, answers to your sort of situation and, and your challenges. I think for me, unapologetically, um, to born and raised as a capitalist, and I'm a really, very proud to one for that matter. And I think that I'm happy to really engage as to what I mean by capitalist, because a capitalist is not really what capitalists are actually projected to really be by the so-called communist and socialist. One breed of um, human beings that I'm, I'm always scared to actually associate with because uh, they're, these are people who, as far as I'm concerned, not genuine, people who are always there to misrepresent themselves. But as uh, some of us as capitalists, uh, we, we can really come out quite open in, in, in our approach. We, we, we love to make money, we make money for ourselves and our families and really actually attain our independence. But it's a system that eventually affords us an opportunity to actually play a bigger role in society. That it doesn't know why I can afford to come and spend the day here with my office and actually come and spend uh, uh, the afternoon uh, with you to obviously really share my own personal experiences and journey because I can afford to. Born just about 55 years ago, so I'm not a, a young man any longer, I'm a senior citizen of this country. Um, just over 55 years ago, 1959, my mother this time was highly pregnant because I was born in August, uh, 26th of August, 1959. So you can imagine, just to really reflect back. Uh, 55 years ago, my mother was highly pregnant, probably, I don't know if she was able to walk. And um, 26th of August, jumped out of her body. <laughs> 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 I 
And um, here is it, 55 years later, here am I. Um, and unfortunately, this is not uh, here any longer to, uh, to really witness um, what she brought into this world. But I obviously, from what I grew up uh, hearing from people around me, the day when I was born, I believe my grandfather was the most happiest, proudest you have the men in our in our village went all over actually telling everyone about uh, the death of his uh, grandson. My mother was actually quite unfortunate that um, her husband um, happened to be my father decided to die when I was only two years old. And I look back at this man, uh, you can imagine uh, growing up without this uh, father figure around been brought up by uh, this uh, single um, woman who was actually very unfortunate because when her husband died, um, the only commercial skill she had was to look after white children and clean white homes. She was a domestic worker. That's the only way this uh, poor woman could uh, commercially survive. And she had, uh, kids to bring up and all of them in school, with the exception of my uh, elder brother, who was at the time not uh, at home at the time. Um, so you grow up in this environment uh, with sisters, uh, all of them at school. Um, and, and my mother also very unfortunate. Uh, um, his husband of his, my father, decided to die before in fact even building a home. So you grow up in this environment where Every few years, so you move from one house to the other. You know, we always had families during those days so because of the uh, uh, the migratory labor system. Um, some family members' homes would really be empty. So occupy one house, and obviously, a few years down the line, someone owns of that house uh, come back, and then we look for another empty, another free home, and that's how we lived our house. Uh, my mother actually, only for the first time in her life, uh, she had a, a, a home we could actually call home in 1987, when actually bought her the first uh, house in her room that she could not really have to be moving from one place to the other. What's interesting about this upbringing that led me to one day to be what I am today, ending up being a uh, a businessman because uh, I don't really come from a, a community and family where there was business. Because uh, at the time when I was born, 1959, right in the middle of a Vruta era, so black people were not allowed to, 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 to own businesses, uh, were not allowed to do certain uh, jobs, so we only had to really do manual jobs and uh, carry passbooks, passbook, men and women, anyone from the age of uh, uh, 16, and um, a work environment restricted to a particular area. So as I'm growing up with a mother, with, a, with this absent mother, come, in, come home from time to time, once a month if we're lucky, bringing us stuff. As I started realizing who I was and uh, start seeing human beings and start making sense of uh, what was happening in the world, I discovered I was right in the middle of a uh, community and family of, uh, of thieves, people surviving by stealing to, that, so, to some extent. My mother would come home um, and uh, as she unpacked some of the stuff that she brought us, Telling my sisters some of the stuff that she stole from her madam's uh, pantry. Every day, uh, most days, um, at night, uh, we go and steal water from Steen Gums Farm. There was a farmer, African farmer, three, four kilometers away from where we lived. We had no running water, so we had to go and steal water from Steen from Gums Farm. We had to go and steal wood literally every day to make fire because electricity was something totally foreign to us. So the only way you could obviously get some energy and really be able to cook, we needed uh, to, to make fire. 
from coal, which we could not afford. So the only way we could really get the energy was to waste steel wood, which was not allowed. So for me, you can imagine I'm four, five, six, I grew up in the, in the era where stealing was part and parcel of our lifestyle or culture. So I grew up, uh, there was no difference between uh, stealing and, and not stealing. And the reason why I'm raising this matter is because uh, we're not thieves. Why I would really say that we're not thieves? Uh, because every Sunday we'll go to church. <laughs> and uh, pray about everything else rather than the stealing part because the stealing part was, was absolutely nothing wrong. Probably some of the, the prayers um, we were trying hard to was to, to ensure that we don't get uh, caught in the stealing process. <laughs> we wanted God to really protect us. And, um, and, uh, and God really provided that shield. But then you can imagine as human beings growing up uh, in that environment, you can imagine it, uh, me having this value system to my kids. It's something that we try every day. Now, as a parent, you get your children to really understand that stealing is stealing, <laughs> you know? But for me, my upbringing, there was no difference whatsoever. Stealing was uh, an acceptable norm. It was an acceptable practice. Why I'm raising this issue? Because it actually troubles, troubles me, and deeply for that matter, as to why human beings actually keep stealing? And obviously I have to really reflect on, on, on the history of our country because this used to happen 34 years ago as we were growing up. So you can imagine people who grew up during my era. So that's, that's a value system, that's a practice, that's the only practice that they know. But we sit in 20 years into our new democracy. We've got people in our government, run, by some of the people I grew up with. And you know, obviously we see the rampant stealing that's happening in our country today. But now the people who are stealing today, not my mother who was earning 19, 20, 29 rands a month. These are people earning three, four, five million rands uh, a year. People who are responsible for the future of this country. Is the stealing maybe part and parcel? It is already ingrained in the system. So we've got a new challenge, and I always call on society and uh, churches, anthropologists, and uh, civil society organization. We need to really do something to really arrest this so that we, we, we have a new value system as, as society. Because if we continue at this trajectory, you can imagine what's going to happen when people obviously don't see people in leadership. We don't see the difference between right and wrong. And uh, in our country today, our politicians, do they see the difference between right and wrong? That's why they can still, they don't see anything wrong with you. Actually, they, they see something wrong with you who are questioning, they are stealing. So I grew up in, in that environment, and, uh, but I hope uh, a society and as a country will find answers to this. One important aspect about Obviously, really declaring my capitalist tendencies or DNA is because uh, today uh, you guys are here as aspirant entrepreneurs and people who are having the ambitions to really go into business. But what the rhetoric do we get to a large extent from political leadership is that uh, it's great to be in business because business people making profits, it's projected and communicated and conveyed to you as if it's a sin. How many of you hear this every day? Political leadership in this country being critical of businesses uh, that make money. Instead of actually celebrating uh, their success, uh, celebrating them making money, because businesses that make money are those that provide um, uh, the future. They're the ones uh, responsible for this building. They're responsible for you guys really being here uh, at university studying. They're responsible for the employment of our people, paying taxes. But the political leadership in this country today says it's the business people are evil, the business people are paid human beings. So we, we, we have this uh, confusion in, in, in our country, in our society. And I think it's something that we really have to really deal with. How are we going to, uh, to uh, 
to one day succeed and win this battle. I think it would really need all of you to, to be active members of society to obviously understand uh, this type of dynamic. There's a reason why I raise openly unapologetically to let you know of my uh, capitalist tendencies because it's something that is obviously not really common in, 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 our, in, our, in, in our country, which is really quite, um, quite unfortunate. So, growing up, four or five, as I said earlier on, you, you have this type of value system. By the time I was in, the time during the period, 1976, I was in Form 3. I wanted to become a, a motor mechanic because I wanted my independence. I thought uh, the only way I could really get my independence is really... Uh, and this is why I chose a motor mechanic at the time because uh, a few cars in our, in our community were scrap cars needed to be fixed every day. I mean, very few blacks can afford if, uh, to, to then buy a new decent car. So all of them had cars that gave them problems every day. So I, I saw a big opportunity and I said, you know what, instead of uh, pursuing with an academic route, the quickest way I can obviously really make a living is to become a mechanic. It was in 1976, Unfortunate for me, fortunate, I don't know how, what, how to really describe it, because uh, when we had the Soviet riot, riots, that the whole country got into major challenges. And um, the, the only institution that would, at the time, train us as black people that to become more <coughs> mechanics was somewhere in the and problems in the Petersburg area. And uh, there was obviously some issue with them uh, accepting kids coming from the reef, uh, coming from a man's crowd Pretoria. So, and I had no parents to negotiate. What's actually quite interesting about my life uh, was that, um, uh, and, and my poor mother, was that um, I don't in fact even remember her one day taking me to school from sub A. When I started sub A in 1966, in a church not far from our, our home. I don't know who took me to school, but I, definitely my mother wasn't around. And until uh, I left school, she was never responsible for negotiating for me to move from one school to the next. So it's really do everything on my own, including actually supporting myself uh, most of the time. Uh, with, uh, with my schooling, Life. So obviously I had no one to help me to, to negotiate to really go to this uh, technical college uh, up, uh, north. and uh, ended up um, going to uh, form four after completing my matric uh, after completing my form three. And obviously during our days as black uh, uh, kids, uh, actually I remember even passing standard six was a huge challenge. Because <laughs> very few of us passed standard six. Then after passing standard six, I went to form one up to form uh, three, and uh, all of a sudden I passed form three, and then I had to obviously be submitted, uh, admitted uh, to go to form four and form five at the same school where I was. But obviously form three I was doing maths and science, and uh, but then uh, the school where it, where it, I could afford to um, for form four and form five we had no metric, we had no uh, maths and science. So that's why I then decided to obviously change my uh, career path. Um, studied and I thought uh, I was going to register when I, if I get an opportunity to go to university, I will uh, register to do law. Fortunately enough, uh, 1978, passed my matric, um, applied to the University of the North, uh, Kefro. At the time, also the, uh, the only university uh, allowed to uh, to admit um, to kids from black kids from Pretoria. You can imagine Pretoria University just around the corner that um, I had to go to Tevlok University in Petersburg. By the distance, I'd never been to Petersburg before. When register myself, organized the funding yeah, for that. Obviously, it was us. Um, when I applied and uh, accepted to study law, but to my Surprise when uh, first week of orientation discovered I couldn't study law um, because uh, as much as I managed to uh, 
plasma electric uh, and with the good signal, but to my, I dismally failed Africans. And um, 1979 in South Africa to study law, you needed Africans and good one for them. So I accepted my reality that uh, it would really be suicidal for me to pursue a legal profession with these poor Africans. So my next option um, registered to study, um, I registered for a PRMAN, major majoring in political science and public administration. That's where being a political scientist came about. <coughs> and really committed myself and, and uh, fortunate enough, fell in love uh, with political science. And I thought um, this is the route. I've really found the niche. I'll, I'll become a political scientist and uh, studies uh, to allow me to one day leave this country. Because never thought at the time, you can imagine I was 18, never thought one day I'll see independence or see this country uh, becoming a democratic country in, in my life. So obviously the dream was to, to study, to get an opportunity to move the country and uh, work outside of the country as a political scientist to be as a lecturer at some university outside South Africa. Fortunate for me, second year of my studies, 1980, one morning we were surrounded by the army. Some disturbances for two weeks, not attending classes because of political disturbances. So, the, so instead of the university addressing our issues, they decided to call the army to deal with us. And the army then decided to give us six hours to leave. So that unfortunately became the end of my academic dream because uh, when we were called back after a month or two, I decided not to go back. Focusing my energies at the time, wanting then this time to leave the country, either go to, to a large extent, uh, Zambia. I thought uh, I would really get the Russians to give me AK-47 and train me to use it so that I can come back into the country and cause havoc. And this was obviously at the time uh, the aspiration and dream of uh, black youth my age. That's really what we wanted to do, all of us. We had the opportunity to leave the country, but then it was not obviously an easy book for you to really leave. You had to have very strong context to allow you to leave the country. Why did I want the Russians and capitalists like myself to get the Russians to be AK-47 to come and cause havoc? Obviously, angry young black uh, men. I grew up uh, one of uh, the, the issues as I was growing up. I was totally convinced that uh, whites are, are an evil creature. And uh, determined to really find ways so that one can, can find AK 47s. At the time, the Russians were happy to give us AK 47s and very kind of cause havoc. I wanted to make sure that I can come back and destroy all these evil creatures. Why did I think at the time whites were evil? As I was growing up listening to people, um, the only thing I experienced from whites at the time was violence to a large extent. If it was not violence, it was total apathy. They had nothing to really do with, uh, with us. Um, if they were not unleashing violence and against us, they were just not really interested uh, with our welfare. Uh, in the suffering. So that's the reason why I thought, you know, we've, I've got to find a way to really destroy these evil creatures. It's really so happened that I was unfortunate or fortunate. In fact, uh, I honestly don't and truly don't know whether I was fortunate or not fortunate that my contacts never got me out of the country. End up uh, two, three months, uh, the university is now reopened and I'm losing time and I'm getting old. I decided, of course, in the meantime, to do something while I'm waiting uh, to get an opportunity to sleep in the country. That's when I got my first job uh, with uh, uh, the company in Pretoria and West called the Spa Distribution Center. I was employed as a dispersed clerk. Obviously, I was lucky that I was uh, one of the few big guys who could read and write, so I got a job as a dispersed clerk, earning 180 rands a month. 
growing up, obviously thinking that these people are uh, these creatures are evil, always avoided contact with whites. So all of a sudden, really, to dominate me, I had to now be in contact with whites. And uh, at the same time, this you know, this fear, this uh, fear that I've always had came into contact with Van Heffen, who was the, the, the distribution, was the, was the, the um, uh, warehouse manager. I mean, this old man hated anything black. Things that I was told about and how, how cruel these people were, it really came into contact with him. And I realized I'm not going to really stay long here. And obviously, I mean, they guys who had worked for, for five at the time for many years, some of them 15, 20 years, their survival was dependent on patronizing Van Heffen and their white coats. I can imagine for me coming from a totally different era. Black kids my age were very angry, were uncooperative, <laughs> you know. So there was no way that I would um, patronize uh, Van Heffen. So obviously by not patronizing him, every day you've got issues with him. I was just really lucky that I've always really been a very proactive person. I don't really wait for someone to actually decide for me. Then decided. What is my next move? Got my second job with Motani Industries, Indian owned furniture manufacturing business. Um, luckily for Motani, no racism, but growth prospects, absolutely nothing going forward. But luckily there was no racism. Working for Motani became uh, my longest salary job for them for two to three months. And during that period, that mean I realized that the chances of living in the country are not there any longer, getting slimmer. So I've got to really do something with my life. Because I've always really had the urge to attain my freedom. I wanted to really be my own human being and uh, really be the one in charge of controlling my life. I'm, I definitely was never born to be part of the collective. Every time people talk about collective, I run away because I don't want to be part of any collective. I was born on my own and I don't want to really be part of this, of any collective. Absolutely, I work with other people, but one thing for sure, I don't allow other people to decide for me. I decide for myself and I take responsibility for my, for my decision. So I then decided, to, hey, how am I going to attain my independence? I can't leave the country any longer. I'm getting old. I was now 20, 10, 20, 23. I mean, sorry, 22. I decided business is the route for me to really attain my independence and my freedom. Well, coming from a uh, uh, business background, uh, so legislatively, as black people, we are not allowed to go into business. But I decided that we come without this legislative for I will go to business anyway. I've got to really find a way. What was the idea? You see in the papers every day companies advertising for commission sales reps. Um, advertise that you want to make a million rents a month, you want to sign your own check. So that's when I raised my hand and I said, That's me. But then, how am I going to become a commission sales rep? I needed the car, so started obviously saving. But then, one interesting aspect about my life and one decision that I always try and really get South Africans in the world to actually know um, that as a, as a young man of 22 took a real interesting decision that I so much treasure. I come from an environment where, um, as boys growing up, um, under the English system of apartheid, uh, always with a frustration. But, we really had one aspect of our life that we enjoyed was obviously the exploitation of young girls our age. Um, so young black girls were the biggest victims of us boys as we grew up. Uh, we, we, we were under the impression this way God given gifts for us boys to enjoy. So as you grow up, uh, with the hormones start indicating to you that um, you need to fulfill a certain part of your, your system. Um, no parental supervision whatsoever. This is something that uh, we, we had to work it out our, on our own. Our parents were not really there. And so the advice you get is uh, from your peers. 
and obviously the advice from the peers is that guys uh, to satisfy ourselves uh, let's have fun with this god-given gift unfortunate uh, for the situation is that uh, the more girls you had the better respect and recognition you received within your, your group so you can imagine weekends uh, Going to Shebins, uh, going to Stockfields, what we used to call Stockfields. Um, you know. So the more girls we had, the better recognition you received from the family of friends. So I realized, guys, for me, for really actually going to business, I need a car. But then there was a danger because obviously any one of us who had a car was a new challenge because weekends was easier when you had a car to find to get girls. So I realized that this is really, very dangerous. If I want to buy a car at my age with all these bed friends around, I'm going to have issues. And I want to buy the car not to, to really be the one to, 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 to be able to really get girls. I wanted to really buy a car so that it can really become an asset for me to really help me to make a living. So I decided, how do I really protect myself from this society? I couldn't obviously divorce myself from this. That's when I decided, I think, you know what, before I buy a car, let me get married. And fortunate enough for me, um, I was in the time of going out to, uh, to one young girl that um, at the time obviously I was uh, deeply in love with her. And I decided, um, let me propose to her. Can you imagine I'm at the age of 22. Marriage to me as I was growing up was never anywhere near my vocabulary. Anyway, near my, my cycle. I thought if ever I get married, it will be later in my life when I'm in the 40s. But now here we are at the age of 22, and this girl is 20, and I decide to get married. And fortunately enough, when I proposed, she stupidly accepted. <laughs> 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 but how great it was, because here am I am sitting just over 32 years, still married to the same woman. And she's really been extremely instrumental in give, providing stability in my life. So I got married to her, and then two months later, I bought a car. And, <laughs> <laughs> and um, obviously, obviously, the boys are thinking that my car is uh, going to be a taxi to get girls. And I said, guys, uh, you know, I'm married. So I'll always have a good excuse that I needed to really go home. And, and really, my wife really provides such a great shield in my life that um, really give her so much credit for, for being here today. So that's really then after buying the car two months later, I resigned and actually started my gambling. I used to gamble in my youth, uh, actually, when I was in, especially from four and from five. Used to play dice and it's uh, very strong uh, for that matter to, to be able to help me go to school. So now this was a totally different gambling that I had to really do. Um, became a commission sales rep, started with insurance, and sold, uh, uh, sold uh, inner services, uh, glasses, linen, fire detection systems, and in the process sold AK products for a company in Johannesburg. And they had a brand called Supercal. So I took my care for 19 months and during that process stopped everything else, focused on hair care product. I then realized uh, to have man, you've got to really be productive in your life. It's a great opportunity. Black women wanted to be pimped. And I said, Herman, it's a great market. This is the, something that's going to be there forever. While these women want to be pimped, go out there and pimp them. And you're not going to pimp them selling someone else's product. You're going to really make them. But I had no technique, I know how. Uh, I was just really a trade salesman. I started making money. And uh, to get this decision, I'm going to really manufacture these products myself. You can imagine 1984 in South Africa, under P.W. Bota at the time, uh, just before the movie was called, uh, <coughs> one state of emergency after the other, but I decided I've got to really make something out of my life uh, and make this product. Took another difficult decision. Um, I needed the, the expertise to manufacture this product. I approached uh, one uh, white guy, African, called Juan Green, 
we used to operate as a factory manager, um, production manager for, for, for this company. Coach uh, Johanna said, Johan, you can make this stuff and you can sell it. If I raise the cash, uh, would you mind to join us? And you can watch in 1984, uh, black and white so contact and uh, discussion and engagement was almost uh, almost uh, tantamount to treason. And I took a chance uh, and I approached Johan. At that time, I decided if Johan doesn't really buy into this dream, that's fine. I already decided I'm going to move for anywhere, make a play somewhere else. Really, very fortunate enough for me to 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 take in that uh, decision to approach your hand with, and your hand accepted uh, my proposal <coughs> and uh, approached the guy from Walter Dube in Mobile, one of the townships, who was a well known businessman. Uh, his wife managed to introduce me to Walter, presented our plan to him. Walter brought into the dream. We needed 50,000 minutes to start our business. So, Walter organized us the funding, organized us uh, premises to operate in the so called Mukutatuana because well, at the time we could not operate in the so called West South Africa. So, we had to go to the homelands of uh, Mukutatuana, uh, Haramkura, which is obviously next to Pretoria. What does the factory slightly smaller than this 200 square meter factory? January of 1985, that's when we started production. We got some few. 200 liter uh, uh, the drums and uh, stairs and really started still making products by hand, uh, feeling every year at night and then we go out and sell. The first uh, leg like me products hit the South African market on the 14th of February 1985. This was the first day we made an invoice and started selling. And we were extremely fortunate that uh, everything worked out for us from day one. Resulting by 1989, we managed to really build my own factory in excess of 10 million rands, which I did not owe anyone for it. This just really gives you the scale of our success from, from day one. And much in under such difficult conditions, and a state of emergency, to, uh, to the riots in the townships, our movements really very restricted. But really fortunate enough, things actually worked out for us. This name, Black Lab Me, just really became a huge revolution in, 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 the, in the country. And fortunate enough, I never attracted PW Bothers' attention to realize how powerful this name would really become. And uh, having Johan as a white partner helped tremendously in, uh, in, our, in my business. Johan, obviously, initially when I needed him, I needed to stay with her know how. But what a very interesting element, strategic element to, to our relationship, he brought his white skin to really deal with official issues. For us black people uh, in the 80s to go to government offices was a very dangerous place to go to. So rather all the government issues to uh, we have a white guy to really deal with those issues. That really helped us. <laughs> At the same time really gave me an opportunity to actually realize how good human beings can be because Johan and I and our families over the years discovered this myth, this perception that I had that uh, once we're evil, discovered uh, the good in, in human beings, it is the political system that obviously really created uh, uh, this um, division uh, between the, the, the races. It's for that reason, I don't know if some of you are aware of my current role, that uh, racism is actually one of the issues that um, I've committed my life in fighting, in fighting openly, unapologetically, really. Because it's really one of the issues that um, I would not really want to really happen in my country while I'm still around and not doing anything about it. And race is not just uh, between black and white. We have uh, racism in the white community, we have racism in the black community. I believe very strongly racism has got to really be protected and we've got to be vigilant about it. And racism is not just the, we've got racist issues to do with tribalism, to do with gender issues. The issue about talking about uh, women being exploited by us was that uh, they are not given uh, gift for us boys to treat always really call out on, on, on our black women to say, please uh, stand up, make sure that our, our kids are not really exploited uh, by the, 
uh, this last chasing to boys. And, uh, and, and, uh, and really ask women to really take responsibility for it because if you don't, these kids will really be under impression that the boys actually love them. And to a large extent, the boys our age, we've got nothing to do with, uh, with love. Uh, we just want really want to sleep with girls. That's all boys are interested in. But how and who should really be responsible in really protecting young girls? I guess that I believe uh, the black women needs to really take that responsibility to show that uh, we should not really allow uh, such values to perpetuate in, 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 our, in our communities. So, by, 19, by late 1990, I had my own factory. New South Africa began to emerge uh, with the unbanning of political parties. Uh, Nelson Mandela released. Great period in our history. Started really seeing light at the end of the tunnel. But at the same time, quite uh, milky and shady that are we going to really be able to really pull through this? And in the process, 17th of November 1993, someone decided to touch my factory. I had a factory right in the middle of the township in Mabopan. Someone decided to touch this factory and lost the physical structures overnight. Kept it, I mean, uh, lucky enough, managed uh, the two weeks by another premises uh, in mid -range. At the time, um, every South African could buy property anywhere they could afford. Uh, so what premises in me but uh, it was a real period, a difficult period of my life. Um, we are trying to really work out on rebuilding this business. You can imagine uh, dealing with banks to finance my operations. Uh, for us as black business at the time, dealing with banks, uh, banks were just there for us to win and deposit our money. That's all the role that they played. But getting finance from the banks was never anywhere in, in, in my system. So rebuilding this, uh, now the new South Africa was a bit challenging, but fortunately enough I survived. 1997 sold 75% of my business to Colgate Palmolive. At the time I thought Colgate would help me to internationalize my business. To over 1st of uh, July 1997. 18 months into this marriage with Colgate, realized my business just refused to be part of a big international company. <coughs> Made an announcement to Colgate to buy the balance of the business. I was lucky I had good uh, corporate advisors uh, with me. First of August 1999, I ended up being the one buying the 75% back from Colgate. <laughs> A case study for business uh, schools. Why I get invited all over the world to business schools to share this experience of uh, imagine a small business being bought by a multinational and they fail to buy it back and turn it around and make it a success of it again. How that happened, obviously, it's a, it's a, sub, it's a topic of discussion in a certain time. 2001 in Cape Town. Parliament started discussions around this uh, black economic empowerment, <coughs> coming up with legislation. At the time, since 1994, always had advances uh, by my white colleagues, uh, always pleading to them, looking for black investors in their business. And because of us, uh, I had contacted people who knew me, uh, wanted me to invest in their businesses. All along, I was not interested. I had my business to run. I just really had the fire. I was still busy rebuilding my business. Sold it to Colgate, buy it back. So I had no time to, to think about this BE thing. I didn't really have an idea what people were talking about. But now with the legislation coming, that's when obviously the reality came on me that with or without me, this is a reality. At the same time, obviously, capitalists like myself, people who were making money were those that were anti-business and anti-capitalism and, and were making money and I said, hey, you, you must be the dumbest uh, human being ever. Stupid capitalist. There is an opportunity for you to really make money. You still want to make money by making pen lotions and shampoos. People are making money, see that's money. I was lucky enough for uh, my the corporate advisors that were advising uh, some guys in Krukesdorp and um, we needed uh, black investors in our business and I invested in this business in 2002. 
by fellow close mentor, um, uh, Johan Osthesen, and his team were looking for great investors. So I was introduced to them, and I did a deal with them. It was my first investment, and obviously in the process, it uh, leaked out to everyone that uh, I've had my first uh, investment, and uh, then all the floodgates opened all the time. People asking me to invest in that business. Resulting in, in 2005, I uh, sold 50% of the bill of Black Lagoon to, to another group in Pretoria because I realized that uh, um, uh, the shampoo and pen lotion business uh, is not where you make money. Uh, uh, so you make money by corporate activity. And that's really what I've really been doing the last 10 years really looking after the, my investments, but I don't, fortunate enough, just in really investing in B activities. 50% of my investments are not in B, but I, I always say to people, B investments are like them because this is when I take advantage of my black skin to negotiate the price. <laughs> but I do investments, uh, really looking after the, my money. And I've got a small uh, business called the Pass Investments, I work with people including myself and I've operated like this for the last uh, 10 years and um, really been a real privileged human being or uh, South African um, to really have lived what's happening <laughs> so I've really had a, a great life the last Eight years of my business career afforded me an opportunity to today. I managed to spend um, more than 50% of my life not just really doing business on social issues. I've become a social activist because I've decided not to really sit back and watch my country being brought into a Zimbabwe type uh, result. And I uh, said to myself, I've got to really do something. So at the moment, um, Really, that's really what I do. Uh, uh, spend uh, my money and time on really working with NGOs uh, to ensure that um, we can really give um, future generations an opportunity in life. At the same time, make sure that we protect our constitution and our democracy. Uh, chaired um, the Free Market Foundation the last uh, three and a half years or so until about a month ago from the Free Market Foundation as a chairperson. I'm still involved uh, with, with the organization because I believe in it. I've been the chairman for three years of the Institute of Directors. And um, yeah, and having fun, shook the country, took the country by surprise. Um, four or five weeks ago, I announced uh, my uh, membership of the Democratic Alliance. <laughs> For the first time in my life, at the age of uh, almost 55, uh, to be a hard member of a political organization, something that I never thought I would do. But obviously, I really needed to really make a statement and ensure that we protect our democracy, which I believe is now established. We're 20 years into it, and I think uh, make sure that our people out there are, uh, must be aware that we've got an alternative. We don't have to go out there and form other political parties. What we do is uh, listen to political parties with their policy statements and are great uh, to a large extent with, uh, with the Democratic Alliance. Are they perfect? Absolutely not. I'm not looking for perfection in life. But at the end of the day, I vote for political parties that are as close as possible to my own personal aspiration. And uh, five weeks ago, I made an announcement that obviously shook the country. But uh, at the end of the day, I wanted to really a debate around this. And that's really what I do. Um, some that I never thought would really be possible one day that I would really be a campaign member of a political organization. But I realize if I don't do this, then I'll be failing myself, I'll be failing my kids, I'll be failing the future of this country. So, and allow our democracy, all of us as business people, as civil society, to really have this kind of open discussions. Because that's how democracies all over the world are built and this foundation is actually created. So that's really, in short, really what I do. I'm happy to, uh, to give you 10 minutes or so for questions if there are. If not, then that's fine. Thanks so much for listening to me. And uh, obviously, I've got my book out there called Black Like You. You 
most welcome to when you get an opportunity to read it. It will give you much better insight as to who I am. All right, let's thank Herman.